free speech zone. Here's your host, Eric Barnard. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Free Speech Zone. I am so happy to be on uh, to be uh, here with you today. I've got a very special guest in the house. We have uh, Jimmy Herndon, who's running for sheriff of Cobb County. Jimmy, welcome to the Free Speech Zone. Thank you for taking time out of your uh, campaign to come here and talk to us today. Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. So uh, first, uh, tell me uh, when you first decided to run for sheriff and uh, why you uh, want to uh, be the sheriff of Cobb County. Well, I've been thinking about it for several years Actually, the longer I worked there, the more I thought about it because I thought there was a better way of doing stuff. There had to be a better way of doing things. Um, things really came to a head um, probably around the beginning of 2017. Um, mm. A lot of changes at work, changes in my life. I decided this was probably going to be a good time to do it. Uh, again, you can't run for sheriff and work for the sheriff. So I began looking for work outside of the sheriff's office, and once I found that, I moved on, and I got with some people and checked out the viability of running such a campaign and as Uh a Democrat, actually, in Cobb, and it seemed like something I could do, and that was worth the risk, and so I decided to do it. Awesome. And uh, so um, so how long have you been in law enforcement? I started in at the end of 2001, so I was, and I'm still in that line of work now. I'm not with the gut with like a government entity. I'm in the private sector, but basically doing the same work. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. So almost 20 years. Yeah, almost 20 years. Well, no, thank you for that. It's a yes, sir. important job. Uh, I was a uh, I was in the military police, so I always got respect for law enforcement in a very special way. Uh, what? Um, why did you go into law enforcement? Uh, ever since I was a little kid, it's just something I wanted to do. I mean, I, I don't know. It's one of them things, like, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. Uh, um, when I was growing up, I mean, I always thought it was a cool job. You actually get to do something. It felt like something. If you're doing it right, something that matters in a day. I get to actually do something. There's tons of days where you just do the routine stuff. But sure. especially once I was a detective, you're actually you're solving crimes. You're doing stuff that you really want to do, and you're you're actually – you can see the difference you're making when you're dealing with the victims and you get the bad guy. Okay, right on, so. right on. If um, what, uh, How many departments have you worked for? Just one. Just one? Yep. When did you uh, make detective? Mm, I think I was the first made detective in, I want to say, 2007. 2007? Yeah, pretty, right, so, pretty so, quick there on. Never, so, so it's over... Over 12 years, you've been uh, been actually solving crime, been out there yeah. dealing with stuff. Well, what kind of crimes have you uh, dealt with uh, the most in this area? Um, my particular thing that I was assigned to when I first started off, um, which I really enjoyed and I wanted to be in, I was assigned to the fugitive unit. Mm. And in that, you just hunt high-profile capital-type crimes, um, murder, rape, armed robbery, the really, really bad guys. You dress undercover, you use undercover cars, you hunt them. Um, using the different methods that we do, right. social media, phones, all that good stuff. And you hunt down people that the regular patrol officers and regular deputies can't find or they're having trouble finding or they flee from the jurisdiction. Sure. Because in uh, Georgia, whether you know or not, if you're assigned to a sheriff's office, my jurisdiction doesn't end in Cobb County. I can, if you run to Savannah, I can go get you in Savannah. If you run to Valdosta or Albany, I can go there and get you. I can go right. anywhere statewide. Nice. And then we also would partner with other agencies, especially U.S. Marshals Task Force, and say, hey, we believe this guy's in Chicago or wherever, and they're awesome. They would help us. We'd feed them the information, and they get it done. They would get them for us. So no, uh, so no issues between uh, feds and local local uh, departments? Because you hear that all the time. You always well, hear the, you know, sometimes the feds are helpful, and other times they're not. The feds want the credit and want to collar all the bad guys, and the you know, they look look down their nose at the local PD or the local sheriff's department. They're, they're two very different jobs. I mean, the federal government will, some of them, they're not out there arresting people every day. Mm. They're doing really big cases that they're too overwhelming, don't have the resources for our local people to do. Right. Um, I had a huge case one time that would probably been awesome to have like 20 people working on it, but I had to do it by myself, and it took like a year. Where they could have probably done it quicker, but... It is what it is. With the marshal service we partner with, they they they're awesome. They're kind of like the sheriff's office of the federal government. They do a yeah. lot of the same things. They protect the judges. They transport prisoners. They hunt people. Yeah. They they, they serve warrants, seize things. The uh, same things the sheriffs do. Um, the current sheriff, he doesn't seem too keen. Even though he says he graduated from the FBI academy, they wouldn't let us work with the FBI. Hmm. Don't know why. 
Um, he's like that a lot about a lot of agencies. He wouldn't let us work with different agencies, only wow. certain ones that he approved of, I guess. Hmm. So currently, uh, as far as I know, the Cobb Sheriff's Office doesn't have anybody on task force with the FBI or really works with them in any way. And that's a that's a detriment to the department to not have that, that to not have that there because then you can't really tap into resources right. to where, like you know, you say you're working on that case where it took you almost a year. So if you had that, you could probably get that done in half time, be out there catching the next bad guy. Yeah, it's just simply sharing the credit with others instead of trying to get it all for yourself. You're, if spo- you, you're supposed to be on a team, right, in law yes, enforcement? you're supposed that, to be, but often I found that it quite it wasn't that way. <laughs> That's one of those things. It's like, it reminds me of back in the military days. You would hear the, the Army against the Navy, against the yep. Marine Corps, against the Air Force. We were all, we all gave each other so much hell. Mm-hmm. And it's like, um, I'm like, and you hear the same stories. Like, I worked a lot with FBI, Secret Service, Diplomatic Security Corps, the State Department, and they would tell the same stories. They would yeah. say, oh, God, the feds are the worst. And they would also say that about how when they would go on a case, we had, I had a Secret Service agent one time. He was in, uh, I think, Denver, and they were doing a uh, a uh, counterfeit case, mm-hmm. and uh, the guy they were looking at was throwing stuff out into a dumpster. So anyway, he shows up there, got his coat and his tie on, and local sh- local uh, officer comes with him, and he's like, yeah, he threw it in there. So the local cop just goes and dives in, mm-hmm. and he's like, and so he dove in with him, and the local cop was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm helping you find it. <laughs> he's like fully dressed. He's like, why? He's like, well, look, dude, I'm, I'm not going to be a fed and not do the job, okay? Yeah. <laughs> So it's it's one of the strange things. So I mean, it, it doesn't surprise me it happens in law enforcement as well. Yeah, I mean, you need you need cooperation. You need to know what each other is doing. There, there was a time where it's <laughs> in so a fugitive unit. Uh, me and my guys got a tip that there's some guys that they've been doing all these fraud at banks and possibly bank robbers. So mm. we show up at this bank. It's up in Kennesaw, and we're doing surveillance. And we see two guys, and they look shady. I mean, they just. They're like looking at the bank door. They're doing all this. We're like, what are these dudes doing? Right. And uh, they get out and see one guy's got a gun. So there's like nine of us. We drop them at gunpoint, get on the ground. And the guy's like, I'm FBI. I was like, if you're really FBI, you know you better get on the ground then. We'll oh, talk yeah. about who you are later. Right. Dropped them, prone them out on the ground. They had the same tip that we did. We weren't talking. We weren't connected. So we know dropping two of our own at gunpoint, and God knows where oh, the bad God. guys were. If they were there, they got away. Right. So and that bad guy saw that be like, oh, God, someone else was casing the bank. I mean, it's the same way if, if a federal agent got to drop on me and I was doing something. I mean, I'm not going to spin around on him. You just got to yep. you got to drop it. I mean, because we were wearing our vests, saying who we were, everything. Sure. They had them, too. They were just underneath their clothes. They didn't have time by the time we drew on them for them to on, expose their stuff. Right. When you drew on them, they were, they were the hands up. No, good listening. guys are smart. They're doing their job, too. That's the, that's good. Um, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the current sheriff, um, uh, Neil Warren. Um, there's been a lot of incidents that have been going on with the sheriff's office and with the, uh, and with the county jail that he's been running, and this has been a Big, it's going to be a big issue in this campaign the further along it goes. I've got some incidents I wrote down. Okay. Um, these are incidents that happened at the Cobb County Jail and with the Sheriff's Department. Uh, the dates that I have here are the dates these were reported in the media, so where the events happened on that same day, I am not 100% sure, but here, I'm going to read these off. Okay. February 23rd, a 31-year-old man died shortly after being booked into the county jail. Autopsy found injuries on the man's back, forearms, right knee, and both shoulder blades. Injuries were caused by being slammed against a wall during a seizure. During a seizure. April 2nd, transgender woman arrested for failure to pay a $15 fine alleges Cobb County Jail staff housed her in a pod with male inmates who abused and sexually harassed her. April 20th, 60-year-old man charged with misdemeanor shoplifting was shoved to the ground by a guard. The man was left on the ground for almost an hour, screaming in pain from a broken hip. Guard who shoved him to the ground had 10 previous investigations against him for inappropriate use of force. May 15th, deputy recruit arrested for allegedly bringing contraband into the jail. July 17th, state ethics watchdog investigates finances of Sheriff Warren's campaign. And the most recent incident, September 30th of this year, 36-year-old man dies while in custody, brings total deaths in the jail to four in the past 12 months. That's quite a string of incidents. Yeah, those deaths are just since December. So we're not even done with the year yet. Right. Um, why? What on earth is happening here? Well, I mean, part of the problem I have, if you're if you're going to run for the office of sheriff, and I'm, uh, the way it is in Georgia, pretty much you could run. Anybody can run, as long right. as you're not a felon. I think you should have worked for a sheriff's office to begin with, mm-hmm. worked in a jail, done all these jobs, know what you're doing. It's always been helpful for me if I'm supervising someone to, hey, man, I know how to do that job because I did it. Right. Even if it was 10, 15, 20 years earlier, I have an idea of what you do. Sure. From what I can tell, looking at the sheriff's records and stuff, he never worked in the jail. He was uh, 
hired directly as a sergeant. He got to skip all the stuff that the rest of the sheriff's deputies have to do, the grunt work where you learn how to do the job. Mm -hmm. And it looks like he was put in CID, and it looks like he rode behind a desk his entire career. Hmm. I've only seen him in a uniform for, like, campaign stuff, but I haven't seen him in a uniform in probably a decade. So he's, a bu- so he's basically a bureaucrat who became sheriff. Yeah, he looks like he was... I mean, it's like that. It was like that back in the day with sheriff's office. To be fair, you had to be a friend of somebody to get hired onto a sheriff. Back, mm-hmm. back, back then, this is... I know he says he got hired in 77. His records say he got hired in June of 78, I believe. But mm-hmm. anyway, and it shows him directly as a sergeant, no other rank. Right. Um, and he just rode that out. He became a... Uh, Chief investigator, which is that's tip top of the ladder there. Right. Within only seven years, six I think six years, nine months of working there. That's wow. just too short of a period of span to, to obtain any kind of. Do even do even the best guys get that that fast? No, 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 no. How long does it Usually take? Usually the best guys bang it out at the bottom for a while because you enjoy what you do until somebody makes you leave. That's kind of how I was. I loved doing what I was doing at Fugitive until they came to me and said. Hey, dude, you've been here forever. You need to, you, you need to take the sergeant's test. And it's a hint, like we're going to move you if you don't do this, and we're going to mm. promote you. Right. And uh, when I had children, I got moved over to the fraud unit. I asked to go over there because the hours are stable. You're not running around day and night chasing bad guys. They're yeah. nice hours for the most part, kind of like banker hours. Sure. Because the people you deal with, that's when they're open. Puts the puts the family, I'm sure, yeah. at ease too. But uh, if Warren's never worked in the jail, and I got his record, he's not even certified as jailer. Like everybody works for the sheriff's office as a jailer certified. Mm-hmm. Um, he hadn't. He's not even jailer certified, which means he can't even walk into a pod and tell an inmate what to do. I guess he could as a sheriff, but legally, the rest of us have to have that certification to work inside a jail. It's a requirement of the state. Right. He doesn't have that, but then again, being the boss, I guess he doesn't have to work in the jail. Mm. But that may be part of the problem is that he never worked there. He doesn't understand it. He doesn't know what the deputies do and what they go through. So you don't know what the staffing levels really need to be. Mm. I. The other problem is when you surround yourself with a bunch of yes men, yes women, people that just agree with everything you say, that's a detriment. You need to have some give and take. You need to have people on your staff that are different from you that say, hold on, I think that's a bad idea. Because I think if uh, Sheriff Warren would have had some people over the last years, like with the KSU incident and stuff like that, suppressing the free speech of those girls, um, if somebody would have stepped back and said, hey, buddy, I, well, hold on, I think you shouldn't do that. Uh-huh. I think that, you know, it would have benefited him, but if everybody's just going to just be yes, ma'am, and, you know, and do exactly what you say, in the end, that's a detriment to everybody that works there because no fresh ideas can come in, nothing happens. Right. But the instance of jail, the jail's horribly understaffed. They can barely run it. I mean, heck, when I worked there, it was two of us versus 400 inmates, and I was what? like an O-pod. Yep. And two, so, two guards for 400 inmates. Yeah, so if you go to lunch, then it's just me. Oh, God. So you got to learn your people skills pretty well on how to not engage and get in fights. You've got, yeah. a, you got a, a civilian. They call them civilian. Everybody's really civilian. You're a cop. I don't know why they're civilian law enforcement or civilian if you're not in the military. Right. But anyway, I think they mean sworn, not carrying a badge. Hmm. So you have a civilian that sits in the tower, and they overwatch the deputies, but they can't help or anything. Right. They just watch. So when you go in there and get in a fight. You're on your own. You're on your own. And it doesn't sound like a long time, but if you're on your own for a minute, two minutes, three minutes. Yeah. That many men can do a lot of damage to you in a short period of time. Oh, God, yeah. Because you hit the floor, you turn into a soccer ball in there. Yeah. Three deputies have went to the hospital this month, two with head injuries. And they both shared a common theme. They were alone when they They were were attacked. So the jail's been critically understaffed. You've got these incidents. Of, and what about this incident where this you know, 60-year-old guy is in there for a misdemeanor charge, shoved to the ground? I don't know if you saw the video. I did. Learned your own constitution. You saw the video. I'll post a link to that description of uh, this uh, video version of this episode today. But he's there. He goes up. He's asking about a phone call. The deputy just, or the, the jailer just shoves him to the ground, breaks his hip when he hits the pavement. They leave him there for an hour. I saw it. Um, why on earth is this happening? And then come to find out this deputy's got 10 previous investigations for inappropriate use of force. How is this guy still on the payroll? Turns into one of who you know kind of thing. I, I mean, I knew who he was. I, I met him when I first started working there. He was working at the jail. Mm. Um, I don't know why. There's a lot of them like that. If you we start to get into that, I mean, there's there's upwards of a dozen people working for him right now have been arrested for light things from, you know, DUIs and all that, all the way up to uh, felonies. Really? Like vehicular homicide, all the way down the line, aggravated assault. Mm. They're all still employed, still working there. He just creates new jobs for them so they can keep them on staff. That is unbelievable. If you're elected, are you going to stop that? Yes. 
Yes. <laughs> if you can't, we can just use the most simplest standard in the world. If you can't keep your job at McDonald's doing it, then you probably shouldn't keep your job at the sheriff's office doing it either. Absolutely. I mean, you've got people's had sex with other coworkers on duty, and he left them employed there. He's demoted some of them. Some of them he didn't. He just reassigns them, but they just... You keep them on staff. I, I don't think Walmart, I don't think a car, I don't think any place would put no. up with you doing that in the workplace. No. And they just cover it up, and they don't report it to post. Like the sergeant that came in in the video you were talking about, mm -hmm. he was demoted, but I pulled his post record. That's the certification for, for officers in Georgia. Yeah. And it doesn't show he was demoted. Really? It's not on there. They didn't report it. I know of another lieutenant that got busted all the way down the deputy. They didn't report it. So that person gets to retire and, say, and claim they're a lieutenant and put it on their resume that they're a lieutenant even though they were demoted all the way. Nobody knows any difference because right. according to their official record, it last shows them promoted to lieutenant with no adverse actions. Mm. So, so, a, so, the paper, so we know they were demoted, but the yep. paperwork says otherwise. So mm -hmm. they can still go on and collect whatever they're going to get in retirement or what have you. Um, with the with all the incidents that have been going on with the um, like I just listed the deaths here that we've dealt with here in Cobb County the officers getting attacked, um, what do you make of these this negligence that's taking place in American jails? Like you know we just had the Jeffrey Epstein case where you know he, he supposedly hung himself. Yep. I think he did. Uh, other people think it was a conspiracy, but. Negligence does happen and it does lead to deaths, even in yes. high profile cases. It doesn't matter how big your department is. This does happen. But this shouldn't be happening. What do you make of this negligence leading to deaths of the inmates? It's uh, They don't have the staff, and I don't like the way the medical unit is run or like, not run. I know Wellstar has been running it, and I know they're pulling out of the jail. Mm. I don't know if that's limitations the sheriff put on them on care or, or what. But. Um, it's it's a really bad situation. Um, I spoke with the family of the guy that most recently died, just died the other day. Right. Um, and I know how he died and everything, but I won't get into that. Um, but I can tell you this. He died in the same room as the previous guy. Hmm. It's a padded cell. Apparently, they moved him there because he was just what I'm getting from people that work in a facility, that he wasn't really doing anything wrong. He was just kind of bothering people and acting weird. Okay. Which should be indicative that he's having a medical situation if he was acting sure. fine before. Um, he'd been in jail for five days, so I mean, my personal experience running a crime scene unit, all that, I can rule out that it's not most likely not drugs. Mm -hmm. um, so he gets moved to this this padded room that has no toilet, has no water, no sink, no bed, no nothing. And he's sleeping on the floor, and it's soundproof. Mm. So if he is in there and he does ask for help, no one hear him. He's just gonna die. Um, and the last guy, I have no idea. I've tried to wrap my head around this every which way, trying to you know, be devil's advocate, look at this. And the guy before him died of dehydration. If I put you in that room that has no food, no water, no toilet, no nothing, and you can't come or go on your own and you die of dehydration, uh, who did that to you? It would have been me yeah, if I'm it. the person in charge. Yeah. You literally, when you take somebody into custody, there's a thing people don't really realize when you take somebody to jail, no matter how bad they are. Mm -hmm. You make them fairly helpless. Sure. They can't eat without your say-so. They can't dress. They can't go to the bathroom. They can't write a letter. They can't use the phone. They can't watch TV. You tell them how they have to have their cell. I mean, you turn them into a helpless person. If they're sick, they can't just go to the doctor. If they have a headache, they can't do it. Um, there's none of that. So you've made them a helpless person. So part of your job as a sheriff is to, you have to care for these people and make sure they arrive at trial, that they can see the judge. That is, is a pretrial facility. There are some people in there convicted of crimes, but for the bulk of the inmates in there, they are people trial. that are simply waiting trial. Mm, right. So they haven't been found guilty of anything. Some are probation violations and stuff, but even then, the judge societies deemed that they weren't so violent. They needed to stay in jail indefinitely. They'd let them out, and they, most of the time it's a technical violation. Right. Uh, Probation is a whole other issue that I don't <laughs> care for the way we use that. But and they end up back in jail. Um, but yeah, when you put somebody in jail, you make them helpless, right. and you're responsible for their care. You have to you keep them from escaping, and you keep them alive and keep them well. Mm -hmm. And it shouldn't be that complicated of a job. No, it shouldn't. It shouldn't be. I mean, death should not happen unless you know, if you know, if a fight breaks out, somebody gets beat up by you know five six guys, you know, you know, and and you got two guards for four hundred people. There's not much you can do to go I save the guy. I literally that that part is literally that, that I know of has never happened while I worked there. That that hasn't. That never happened. Which is good. Yeah, but that's if good. you. Say, for instance, I'm in this room and I start to have a heart attack and grab my chest and I want to call out for help and no one comes because they can't hear me, see me, nothing. Then yeah. 
you have the what if situation. Now that person may have died from that heart attack anyway, but okay. if they could have had medical attention or help or someone even seen them, yeah, then they could have continued. Could have been avoided. Potentially, you know, yep. the, the the risk the risk goes up for them to be found alive. Well, let's talk about the medical unit then. So the medical unit is not running; they're not doing it right. What's what's wrong with them? It's I wish they let people see it. It's really, 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 really bad. I, I would be extremely worried if somebody I knew entered in that facility and had to get medical care. Really? Yes. Um, well, they've got doctors on staff that won't even do stitches for people. So. That happens from time to time. Somebody gets punched. It should be one of the most basic things there is. Yeah. My wife's in the medical field. She's like, what do you mean they don't know how to do stitches? I was like, well, they won't do them. Um, so it's not they don't know how. They just won't do it. No. Well, I don't know. I don't want to get into conspiracy stuff. But part of the thing, if you've got a Wellstar facility and they can't send people to Wellstar Hospital and it's a for-profit entity, mm-hmm. then it drives the bill up dramatically. Okay. And no matter what care the inmate needs, taxpayers have to pay for it. Right. So I've seen people come in like for falling down and on me or you, they wouldn't do a CAT scan and an MRI and all this crazy work up on them. They yeah. do everything on them. Mm. But the medical unit, when you walk into it, their cells, like the worst, I'll, I'll touch on this. The worst part of it is the suicide watch rooms. So Mm -hmm. let's say you came to jail and you're feeling suicidal. You're feeling really down about yourself. That's a reasonable thing, especially if you've been charged with a big crime, regardless of where you did it or not. You're on the news, you're on this, and it happens a lot. You're embarrassed, your family, your friends, they saw you go to jail. It's stressful. You don't know how to get out of there, especially a person that's never been in there before. So they ask them, hey, are you feeling suicidal? Do you feel bad? Do you feel like you're going to hurt yourself? If they respond yes, they get taken away, and they don't know what's happening. They take them away. They take them to the infirmary. Two to three deputies stand there and tell you to strip. And when I mean strip, I mean like Everything. the day you're born. Mm-hmm. And they hand you this smock, which is made out of like this seatbelt type material that's got Velcro on top. Mm-hmm. Um, inmates call it like a turtle suit because it looks like a turtle shell that goes on you. Okay. Um, you then lay on just a mattress because they won't give you sheets or anything on the floor in a room with seven, eight, ten other people in the same predicament in a room... It's not much bigger than this. Oh, God. They do have a toilet in there. These are grown men. Yes, and women. They do this to both. They do it to both. Yep. And they put them on the floor in there, and they just lay there. And when they're served food, they're served their food, and they get to eat it with their hands because they're deemed suicidal. Yeah, can't use utensils or anything. I don't believe in this one-size-fits-all type thing. No. So we somehow don't have psychologists and psychiatrists on staff, at least not 24-7. If you're going to do this watch, then we could probably find somebody in the psychology field that would want to work for the right salary at the jail at night and weekends and all sure. that stuff. There's plenty There's plenty of med students you yeah. could probably get in and have them do this. It'd be good something to see if they want to try this. So they'll sit in those cells, and they see them in the order received. So you could sit in that cell two, three days. If you go in on a Friday, man, I feel horrible for you because— why or this, you're going to get seen as Monday or Tuesday by a doc. Good guy. So if you're not really suicidal, it doesn't matter what you say and how you act, you're going to stay there laying on that floor doing that thing. Can't shower, can't do anything. No soap, no toothbrush for you, no utensils. For days. Yes, you just eat out of a container. So anybody that actually is suicidal, they are never, ever going to say those words again. Right. They are never going to let anybody so know. That way, so that way when they don't go and they do hang themselves in their cell or do cut their wrist with the butter knife they steal yep. from commissary, then... You know, it's like, well, he didn't say he was suicidal. It's like, well, you see how the suicidal people get treated? Yeah. He doesn't that, want to go that, back and That's my that. up with it. You're going to have, and you're on a facility like that, you're going to have, there are going to be some suicides. Sure. No matter if, I, if inmates know the routine, they know how often we check on them. All they got to do is wait. We just checked on them. They know we won't be back for X number of minutes. Right. You can hang yourself in just a very few minutes and it's they, over. Yeah, exactly. So this... So, but this negligence that's happening and this can't... I don't like the way they treat them in there. And then the jail facility is very limited on what they can do. It's way too small. Mm. Way too small. How And uh, how small are we talking? If you can... I think the infirmary's got 15 cells. 15 cells for just that's the infirmary alone. Yeah. And we have a population about 2,000 in the jail. And they don't come in in the best of shape. No, I'm sure not. So they're all beat up. They're all messed up, and they may not get care for themselves on the street, but again, our job is to keep them alive, <laughs> get them ready for trial. So if we find somebody in there, hey, man, you had to take your blood pressure medication in a year, your blood pressure is like 180 over whatever, they're going to put you on blood pressure meds. Oh, yeah. But it's going to take a while to get you stable and all that, but everybody for every condition is stuck in one little place there, and they're just packed in there, men and women. And that leads to hostility. That leads to tension. Infections. I mean, infections. if you got into the number of people that have staph infection, I've seen they're nasty. 
And because there's not a way to really get, it's a jail. You can't really get clean in there. No. And the infirmary's not. Especially very if clean you're in, at all. especially in a place, no soap, no no to, no toilet, yeah. no bathroom, no nothing. Then God, you know, you bring one person there, it's sick. That whole pod's gonna get sick, and within 72 hours. Just what I know, standards of care. All right. So every time you go out of a hospital room, what do they do? They clean it. Yeah. Not there. <laughs> not there. They don't. So when it comes out, they have another inmate spray some like Lysol on the mattress, throw it to the side. That's it. Good Lord. That is, that's not how you do it. And they might sweep out the room. Might not. Maybe. But that's it. That is not the way you need to do it. So more money needs to be put in that. The infirmary has to be expanded. It just yeah. has to. Because quietly, Cobb County pays God number, a god awful number of lawsuits that you never hear about, never see about because of this kind of care and what's happening. I was about to say, I'm like, this stuff is going, because the, the guy that got his, the 60-year-old that got his hip broken yep. by, the, by the jailer, threw him on the ground, left him there for an hour. He's suing right now. And they kept that guy on staff. Yeah, and they kept they kept the guy on staff. It's like, are you kidding me? And this negligence can't. I think he got fifty thousand dollars out of that. I think they, they settled. settled. That you one. think they settled it? Yeah. But again, that's fifty thousand dollars to foot the bill. You know, mm-hmm. the next and the next one's going to go on. And again, that's that's just the settlement. You got to pay the lawyers. You got to yep. you got to do an investigation. Uh, you got to you probably got to let the deputy have or the jailer have time off to go testify and all, yep. the, all this stuff. Probably got to put him on paid leave so he's not there. That makes the workload harder for anybody else. So you get into all these on all these issues that really it just comes down to, I think the lack of caring is the big issue here. Yeah, because they, his paycheck is the same. The sheriff. No matter what he does, no right. matter how much or how little, his paycheck is based off population in the county. So he gets paid no matter the job he does. Our deputies, I was one of them. We went five, six years without raises. I looked at it. That man gave himself a raise every single year, no matter what. Wow. I think if your guys aren't getting a raise, you don't take the raise. No. Because what does that say to your staff when you're like, oh, I'm going to get mine. I'm going to get paid. You guys don't. Right. Well, it's going to be hard to keep people or yeah. good people, and the only people you can keep are probably the people that will be loyal to you because they're like, well, I can't get hired anywhere else if and I leave here. And that's dangerous because of the type dangerous. of people they are. No, and uh, listen, if, if this is the ki- if this is the kind of stuff that's being bred in this department, this is definitely going to be an issue because you know all it takes is the is the quote wrong person getting arrested in Cobb County, and what I mean by the wrong person is this person that's probably as prominence who's well known, yep. and that person goes in there. God forbid they get beat up, they die, they you know commit suicide, what have you. Then talk about you know the you know the the shit storm. <laughs> We've <laughs> had prominent people come in there, and when they do, they they know who they are and they separate them out and they take care of them so they don't have all that happen. I mean, we've had professional baseball players in there, yep. singers, the yep. whole wrestlers, the whole nine yards in that's, there. That's 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 different. But yeah, they get <laughs> really literally they get special treatment yep. when, when they you shouldn't. Got, when you got the celebrities coming in there, I'm like, yeah, I'm confident they actually they're made sure they're they're mm-hmm. not getting stuck in the suicide pod with the 15 people and with no soap, you know. I'm pretty sure but tell me about that because I'm always wondering. So you say they do get special treatment. Yes. Can you uh, tell well, me? You, you, don't, got, you, don't you, to, you, you don't have to mention names. You, you, you've got a well. There's a couple things. Somebody might want to. Um, somebody might want to take a shot at them, beat them up. You know, just because of who they are. Yeah. Any stuff like that. Um, but yeah, they they get extradited through the system. They get pushed through fast. If you're friends with somebody, you get you make your bond faster. You jump to the front of the line. Because mm. the way it works is we you. We're gonna you know you wait in line your turn to get fingerprinted next photoed next all right. that now nah, they'll go to the front of the line they'll get kicked out there's this whole political favor issue wow but um and I, you saw that yeah uh, the, one of the only guys I saw that didn't put up with that is if you remember uh, I I mean I met him he was in there in the jail I had him in there if you remember Ti the rapper yeah oh yeah I he that. was in there he didn't care to be treated special nothing he didn't have any problems he did exactly what he was supposed to in and out normal person. Wow, what was he in there for? Something small? Right. Probation violation. Probation violation. Yeah. Wow. The probation gets a lot of people. Oh, I'm sure it does. I wish they'd just give them a shorter sentence and just have them actually serve the time and they'd be done and get out. That would be good. Uh, probation's a trap for younger people that, you know, they, they're yeah, going to get in trouble. One slip up, you're going right back in. Well, there's been studies done on it. When you start getting past two years probation, the benefit of probation to recorrect and do your behavior has lost the benefit. And now we're just watching people to get... I mean, they get money out of it. There's a whole industry on that. Really? Yeah, if you're on probation. You got to pay a fee every month. How much? It ranges from thirty-five to fifty dollars. It can be higher. Good God! And you think how many? I think Georgia's number one for the number of people on probation in this country now. And so we have all of these people on probation. Yeah. I think Georgia, I read, was one in thirteen adults are on probation. That's crazy. That is a 
humongous business. Yeah. This is the ninth largest state in the country. Yes. And we're number one in probation. Yes. One in 13 people on probation for this. You know, well, obviously, nobody wants to shut down a spigot of money. No. For that. Nobody wants to do this. But nonetheless, you know, you're making money off people's misery. Yeah. I'm not saying let people go, but give them a sentence. Have them serve their sentence. Yeah. Get in, get go, out. If they need to do probation, give them probation. But I've seen it arbitrarily handed out like candy. Really? Yeah. The, the inmates used to have a little saying like, you know, like, you know, come to Cobb County. Come on vacation, leave on probation. <laughs> but always, <laughs> because you you're, know you're going to get some sort of probation. Wow. Um, so you got these people that are out there on probation. They're paying these fines or what have you. Uh, what do you think about you no know, criminalizing a lot of these young people that, you know, they make one mistake, they're getting hauled in, you know, and they— your life's over. Well, Cobb, Cobb's done really well in that element our courts have. They've got a lot of accountability courts now. And if you get in those courts, like the, the accountability court for drugs or DUI or whatever. Right. So if you get in those courts, and they're long, it's not it's not a cakewalk. It's not something easy. It's really hard. Uh-huh. And I mean, it'll last for like two years. If you do everything you're supposed to do, they'll like clean your record up. Hmm. They get you legitimately off drugs because they hold you accountable. Sure. You get called in every week. You got to report and just sit here and talk to the judge like we're talking. Mm. I saw it when uh, Judge Krieger ran it, and uh, he's retired now. But when he ran it, he'd sit there and talk to him one on one, just like this, and yeah. talk to him like, "Man, what are you doing? Why are you making these bad decisions? Test them. They test positive for drugs." He's like, "Sorry, man, I'm gonna throw you in jail for a week, teach you a lesson real right. quick." So they go in for a short period of time and they're back out. Okay. Eventually, you'll get the idea, or he'll send you to prison. Mm-hmm. So you're in there for an offense they could have sent you to prison for. Sure. It's a drug offense, a lot of possession. People that sell don't get to go to that court. It's possession, people using them. Sure. So, yeah, I mean, I think stuff Addicts. like that is, is a great program. They have a veterans court in, in Cobb County. Yeah, I remember, I remember hearing about that so, you know, There's a lot of veterans with untreated mental illness. Mm-hmm. Um, after they're done with their service, you had all these awesome skills you learned in the military yeah. that you can't apply anywhere. They're like, what did you do? Well, you know, I used to, like, drive tanks and shoot stuff, and it's freaking awesome. Not a lot of conference skills like that. And you, it doesn't translate into the civilian world. And these no. people end up, they end up find themselves in bad situations and do something dumb. And or they can't get, can't get good, you know, they get divorced. You yeah, know, yeah. Their health, their health's bad. You know, I've, I've dealt with this. Their health's bad. Not, not just mental health, just your physical health. Yeah. Your health's bad. Your wife left you. Your kids don't talk to you. Yep. It's like, you know. Obviously, you know, that leads to drinking. There's they, get, exce- they get in a bad spot. They get in a real bad spot. And whether they suffered whether sexual trauma in the military or an injury, what have yeah. you, it sets them up to where they come into the civilian world that's not really adaptive and not very welcoming, no matter, despite what people say. And they get caught up in this issue, and then, no, they wind up in jail somewhere yeah. they never wanted to be. And that's no good place to be. It's a good thing that Cobb is, and other other parts of the country are doing that now, having veterans courts actually, you know, helping veterans. Yeah, to Cobb even knows them for juvenile offenders now, too, which, I mean, that's, that's a great deal. Yeah, that's where you need to get in there if you can before yeah. they start hitting that permanent record. Sure. Yeah. Would Would you ever um, uh, want to see the? Um, does Cobb County have like a scared straight program to bring in the kids that are at risk of you know becoming criminals and no, see what jail's no, like? Sheriff Warren doesn't want people seeing this jail. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, the way it's being described, I guarantee that might scare a few people straight. Oh, it, 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 I think it would. I'm like, would you institute a program like that? Yeah, we could, but the, you have to. The judge has to be on board with that. I know they do it in Fulton County. Yeah, Fulton County does um, it. The judge has to be on. Board board with it, agree to it, and yeah. kind of sentence them to it. But yeah, yeah, in the right circumstances, I think it'll be okay for the right type of offender. Yeah. You know, you got some kids, you know, it's like some people coming at them hard doesn't work. Some people need a softer approach. You got to you gotta feel out the person you're dealing with and see if it'll work for them. Right. Um, how is that with the with your kids? You know, the, you know, no, your kids know, you'll find out if they're doing anything wrong. Yeah, I've got four boys. I mean, just because I've been in law enforcement doesn't mean my kids can't do anything wrong, but I mean, they, they do well. They do what they're supposed to do. Yeah. They want to do. I mean, I'm pretty firm rules at home, nothing crazy, but you know. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, but I mean, so. that's even more like, it's like, hey, you know, I used to catch bad guys. I'll find out if you're doing something wrong. Yeah, and basically, like, you don't want to do anything to embarrass me. Look, look what I'm doing. You'll embarrass us. This, you know. Yeah. You, you don't want to do anything to, to hurt your name. That's a good motivator right there, yeah. embar- embarrassment. You ever, you ever seen one of those judges do those creative sentences, like, you know, instead of, you know, sending people to jail for 30 days or a year, they actually make them do something humiliating? Like uh, Yeah, I've seen go, that. They don't, st- they don't do stand- that in Cobb, but, yeah, I've seen, I've seen that yeah. on Go stand in the landfill for, you know, for I've eight hours. I've seen that one with that woman, yeah. You saw that one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually saw that. I forgot what she did, but it was something so, to yeah, do with it was for her. animal cruelty. That's what it was. Yeah, oh, she, because he threw her dog like in the trash or something. So he's wait, like, well, you she had him, in the trash. She, she, have him, she had him living in trash, okay, and, yeah. like, feeding him. Yeah, and so the judge was like, okay, so I can give you I can give you a year in jail for this, or you can go and you're going to spend eight hours at the landfill. Yep. 
and she took out and she stood there, stood there in a dress and flip flops. Yeah, because she showed up and they were like, that wasn't a good shoe choice. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, just mounds of garbage. Yeah, it is but, what it is because a lot of times you'll learn more from that than sitting in a cold room for 12 hours at jail. Yeah, exactly. It's like, it sounds like an extended time out. Because you're like, this This actually stinks. I don't want to do this literally. Yeah. So, yeah. And people are going to remember, hey, that's the one that had to go stand in the garbage. Yeah, the anything day. that we can do to divert people, for that you hear that school to prison pipeline, anything we can do to divert people from having to go to jail in the first place. Yeah. Because once you go in there and you have to stay in there like that, I don't care who you are, it's going to change your perspective on things. It's, and it's not always in a positive way. Some people are like, oh, you went to jail, you learned your lesson. That's not how that works. No, like I've had a, there's a guy, you know who Bernard, Bernard Carrick is? I don't know. Now, he he used to be the commissioner of the NYPD. He was commissioner on nine eleven, and okay. he went to he went to uh, fe- now I know who he is. Yeah, you he went to fe- he went to federal prison in the yeah. late two thousands, and he said, you know, in prison, he's like, you, this is what you learn: you learn how to lie, cheat, con, gamble, and most importantly, you learn how to fight one yeah. way or another. And it doesn't matter if you go to you know to you know the hardest, you no know, top of the line prison you can go to, or if you go to a, a minimum security camp where he went. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what happens. Yeah, oh yeah, they don't. Bad guys don't stop being bad guys because he went in jail. No, there's a segment of people in the jail that are truly bad, and they will prey upon the rest of them. Those are the ones who belong in jail. Yes, and that's why I'm saying if there's a way to keep them from going to jail in the first place, they should because the majority of people aren't that way. But they'll be preyed upon by the ones that are exactly. And then you get caught up into that. You you engage in the prison hustle. Mm-hmm. You know, there's something you learn, and then you can't get back into the community because you no. Know, Chances of getting a mortgage, getting on public assistance, you know, getting yeah. loans. It's all diminished, especially if you're a convicted felon. Yeah, you're not. If you're a convicted felon in Georgia, you're... That's a life sentence. Yeah, I'm hoping they work on that, too. It's just, that's... You think it should, you think it should be that way? Speaking personally. Yeah. So the particular offenses, nonviolent offenses, non-sex offenses. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you got caught with marijuana when you're like 20 years old and you're like 40 now, what, what good does it do society to do this to you, to keep you... What if it's cocaine or meth? To keep you from voting, if it was personal use and they've never done it again and you've been clean all this time, yeah. I think there should be a pathway to to eventually... Get your rights the back. The whole thing is, is we want to reintegrate, you hear that word, reintegrate people in society. Mm-hmm. But do you really, if you're making them wear a scarlet letter, do you really want them to reintegrate in society? No. no and eventually, now I'm all about, you do something dumb, go to jail, get punished, That you know, that's you, that's on you if you did something stupid. Exactly. But eventually, like, they can petition in Georgia to get their hunting rights back. They'll get their gun rights back. Um, they can vote again and stuff, but you have to petition and, like, plead for it. Right. Or, I mean, eventually, once you've completed all of your sentences, I mean, probation, parole, paid all your fines. You paid your dues. You're actually done. Yeah. I know some people are like, oh, if they're on probation, but uh, probation just means you're serving a sentence on the street. You're still under sentence. Yeah, you're and still Anytime you could go back to jail. Yeah. If you do something dumb, yeah, yeah, you don't come in, you don't make your right. curfew. It's just like parole. You, you do something dumb, you go back. Yeah, um, but after you've done everything, sure. But no, we don't need to do it for sex offenders. You're no. murdering people. No. Or, you know, and we have certain laws like you know, uh, spousal abuse, domestic violence. Mm. People need to know who they are. If you beat this snot out of your own family and your kids, you're yeah. a, you're you're a danger. People need to know who you are. Yeah, you're a, you're a danger to society yeah. if you do that, and. Um, that and especially for you know people that don't know your past because people come out change your name tell a different story. Most yeah. of those type of people are all happy, friendly, and that's why you're always like, oh my god, I'm shocked. I can't believe you know Bob did that. And yeah, well, Bob's family can believe it, but yeah. you can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. you don't live with Bob. Yeah, it's it's just it's that's so screwed up. It tr- it truly is. But yeah, but, but yeah, you're right. There, eventually, there are, I've known are, people I went to high school with. Um. I had a friend of mine um, just down in South Georgia. Yeah. Guy broke in his house, was assaulting his mom. Um, he goes in there and has his rifle. Um, the guy's fleeing from the house. Okay. Uh-huh. And at that point, the he law can't... says you're no longer a threat. Right. He fired and he shot him, hit him in the arm, didn't kill him, nothing like that. He became a convicted felon for aggravated assault with a firearm. The guy's beating up his mom, and everybody's like, dude, I would have done it. So, yeah, but once the guy's disengaged, once he's, he's right out of the house. You get the whole morality of it, but what the law says is you can't do that. I so know. he's convicted felon. And do, do I think he should be punished for the rest of his life for that? The fact he, that he got more, the defense he did was greater than what the guy did. The guy broke in the home, that's a burglary, yeah. and then hit the woman. That's just a mystery, men or battery. Yeah. He 
and the lies of the law did a much greater, more horrible offense by defending what he felt was defending his mother. Yeah. I think he was 17 or 18 years old when that happened. Life's over. He's my age now. He's, yeah. I'm 44. Yeah. Life's, o- life's over. Yeah. I mean, Pretty much. 17 I, years old. Them, you, you come and your mom's getting them beat up. I mean, it changed this whole path in life. Of course it did. So I don't, oh, I don't think that should happen to people like that. No, that should that shouldn't happen. The fact that even anyone, anyone would even convict him or even prosecute him is beyond me. It, but it that happens. goes to, but that that's another issue. You know, people is prosecuting because they want to rack up their conviction rates. Like yeah, it's a you contest. Can't, you can't shoot people once they're running away from your house. You have a right to defend your home, your person. But you're right. But you can't. That's one of those issues right there. It's one of those. It's the one of the areas where you know morality and the law yep. are very black and white. Yep. You just can't do that because he's not. A threat anymore? How do you how do you feel about this push with this uh, concealed carry and a campus carry now? Where do you stand on that? The law's the law on that. I can't. I mean, like I said, I think I I, I say this sometimes before to other people ask me. I mean, my job is to enforce the law, not make them. Yeah. On that, it's a complicated issue. I mean, I don't think we should have to have guns everywhere. I mean, I just kind of I don't know. Okay. I, I haven't seen where it's incidents unless you could tell me something else where. Someone having a gun on a college campus here in Georgia would have helped or made a difference or something like that besides university police. Mm. Now, I'm thinking about just right here in, at KSU. Man, for the population, they have a bunch of cops. They do. They're visible. They're everywhere. They seem like they do a great job. Yeah, they're, they're, they, the actual police department I mean, is right next to the to the building where I do most of my classes. Their headquarters is right there. Yeah, so I just crossed from that children's building. I know where they've moved it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the stadium. But, yeah, I mean, they seem like they do a great job. So in that instance, I'm kind of like— how would this benefit? Sure. You know, I, I just don't, I don't quite understand it. It's understandable. Like having a firearm and keeping it in your car or something's one thing, but I have this whole thing when people want to wear their guns out in the open. Mm. I don't know, it kind of seems like you want attention because why would you? Right. Well, I mean, that. see, like, you know, I have concealed carry. Like, you don't I'm know like, if I have a gun on me now because I no. don't want to wear it out in the open. If right, exactly. And like, when I, and like when, when I carry, uh, you don't know I have it. Right. And uh, I'm not going to tell you I have it. Right. There's no need to. And. I'm a, and people are like, you know, if people were worried about me, I'm like, listen, I carried a gun every day for 10 years, worked in private security after I got out of the military. I'm more than equipped to use this firearm and yeah. to handle it safely. So you're in good hands with me. And yeah. if someone was to do something, I won't miss. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I fired. I will hit my target. Yeah. Um, and I'm certainly, you know, I have my worries about letting just anybody go out and get this because uh, they're of age. They pass a background check, all that. They can now do this. I wish they had some training in Georgia. I, if I want to go hunting, <laughs> if I want to go hunting for deer in Georgia, I got to take a hunter safety course and right. sit through days of that to kill an animal. Yeah. But if I literally walk in a gun shop and say, I want something to kill a human being, there's no training because it is our Second Amendment right, and they just hand it and go out the door. Well, I'll, it may be all right. It might not be the best way of going about it. That's all. Sure. I just wish they trained people. Well, you know, that's it's, it. it's the one thing. It's like, you know, it's like, well, yeah, it's your right, but you also need to be responsible. Like, you rights don't, come with you, responsibility. Yeah, you don't have to have a, uh, you don't have to have a, you know, a permit to carry. To carry concealed, you do. Yeah. You don't have to have a permit for that or to have a rifle or any of that. Right. So if we want to have training to go along with the concealed classes, I don't think that'd be a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Firearms from reality, this is how it does. It's dangerous. I'm you sure know, people be willing to do it. Don't blow your hand it. off, all this kind of thing, because the license isn't. It isn't required. You don't have to have it. If yeah. you want to carry concealed, you do. Yeah. So if you want to carry concealed, then fine. Then take these courses. But otherwise, you, there's still an option for you to carry. You can throw a rifle over your shoulder and walk up down the street, no license needed. Yeah. Well, how do you feel about um, about school safety? You know, after we had the Parkland incident, we had the Sandy Hook shooting, Columbine was back in the 90s. About what we have to do to ramp up school safety and keep kids safe because nobody wants, no, God forbid, somebody walk in. Like you just said, nobody needs a permit to walk around with a rifle right. on their back. Walk, just walks onto a schoolyard, yep. start shooting kids. Well, the thing down in Florida, Parkland, um, the deputy just, let's be yeah, honest. There, he, there he was did, the one deputy. He, he heard the shots. He did not go in. He it, didn't do his job. It's not for everybody. And if people think it is on TV when you start hearing gunshots and you start doing all this. It's, right. it's not for everybody. Um, most people think they have an idea how they'll respond when something violent happens. A lot of that's in their head. Yeah. And then you get to see, and somewhere along the line, that guy had made it that far in his career and he had never been tested, or he had been tested, and this would be the worst case scenario. They just moved him in a position they thought he wouldn't encounter anything violent, which is a very, that's very likely. That's very, very, li- very likely that, that um, happens. The other instances, the other schools, I don't think any of them. I, I can't remember one where someone wanted to come in and shoot up school where there was an armed, capable officer there. 
and they got and they did anything. I know there I cannot remember where this one's at, but I know a guy walked into school and tried to begin to shoot up a lunchroom and a cop dropped him before he even got off one round. As soon as he pulled the gun out, he was gone. Right. Um, and he his intention was totally to there shoot were, the place. And up. there was another one where a guy came in with a gun and the uh, school resource officer who was a sheriff's deputy, she drew on him. Challenged him immediately. Challenged him right there and nobody got killed. Yeah. It's people want to, those type of people want to come in and shoot people that can't do anything back. And even if we make guns legal everywhere, the bottom line is everybody's not going to choose to carry a firearm. Yeah. They just aren't going to do it. They're not comfortable and, and doing that's it. Their They're right. not going to do it. That's their right. You don't have to. And they don't have to. They should be able to walk around, not have to worry about getting shot. But schools, it's it's kind of easier fix to me. You, you put a resource officer there at each school. My kid's school, without naming which one it is, I cannot get in the thing. <laughs> without hidden buttons, being identified, being on camera, I cannot get in the thing. I've tried. I tried to test them and see how they were, if sure. I could get in them. I went to the back, screwing with them one time to see if I could get in. And this is in Cobb County. I could not get in the school. So I was like, this is pretty good. I can't get in here. Sure. That's a problem in the first place. But the problem is we had up in and uh, Sandy Hook is they had secure doors like that, too. He just shot through them and walked through. Right. Because he had AR-15, and it was easy. Sure. Um, but, yeah, if you have a trained person on campus, the Columbine shooters were outside doing stuff. Yeah, if before they went in. Until an officer engaged them, and then they yeah, ran inside they the school. Inside. I keep was outgunned, and he was running out of ammo. That was his problem there that day. And back then, they didn't have the, they, they didn't want you to pursue people. Now it's, now it's even if you're by yourself, go direct threat. You can say what you want, but if you're lying at work and you put on the uniform, your job is to step in front of other people and take that guy down. That's right. I know there's court cases that say your job is not the court. Supreme Court's ruled it's not our job to necessarily protect people. That's the U.S. Supreme Court. Yep, it's only to 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 enforce the law. But my personal thing, if I put that uniform on, man, I, I want you to get behind me. I'm going to engage that guy. I'm going to deal with that guy. Yeah. That is how you need to be. The guys I work with, that's how they were. Yeah. That's the way we were trained. When we, when we did active shooter training, active shooter response, first thing they told us, your job is to go direct to threat. Yeah. You hear shots, you go where those shots are, you find the shooter, you take him or her out. That's your job. Um, the, scene, the scene will get secured, Okay. But you gotta stop someone from killing people. Yeah, that's priority number one. So, like with the, that deputy that didn't do his job, didn't go in, didn't respond. It was like, yeah. Then did he go to jail? They charged him with a crime. It'll never fly because you don't have obligation to protect people. It's not like uh, yeah, because the Supreme Court says that not, now he's yeah, kind of safe. It's not like a nurse where you know you have a duty of care. You have a duty. He didn't have a duty to act under the law. Hmm. which is messed up. Yeah, that's real messed up because, hey, you screwed up, people died, kids died. Yeah, I mean, it's even like when I was a deputy, that's what I had to do. Even when I worked in the jail as a, as a deputy sheriff jailer, when two inmates, another guy's got a guy on the ground beating the crap out of him. I mean, there's guys three times my size in there, and I'm like, this is going to suck, but I got to give it a go. Yeah. And you go in there and do your thing, and eventually your backup gets there, or it doesn't. But you got to get in there. Yeah, exactly. And and again, the whole Parkland thing, there was a lot more to it than just the one guy woke up one morning and said he's going to go kill people. No, he was not the right person there. Well, that guy had a serious background. Yeah. And that deputy report, there, he was not the right person the for deputy that job. Wasn't, the deputy wasn't the right person to do the job. The system failed to keep this guy in check. And it just, we know what happened. And yeah. it's just, it's wrong, period. There's no other way to look at yeah, it. Yeah, but I think, I mean, our most important things to me in this world are our children. They're the people that will continue on for us, take care of us when we're old. They're the future of the country. Right. You can have a resource officer at each school to help protect them. Yeah, exactly. And um, sometimes all, you don't even, they're there. They're, you, they probably won't even have to be used. I'm like, because once people see that they're there, yeah. they're like, Okay, I'm not going to go there. Cobb County has a, a campus police. They do. And some of you look at, I've heard, I heard somebody the other day said, oh, that guy's kind of old, whatever. I said, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that guy retired after 20 years with the PD. He's not somebody you want to mess with. He no. might look like whatever, but he knows exactly what he's doing. <laughs> and in Cobb, that's what they have. They have a bunch of retired officers working these schools, and they're, they're people that know what they're doing. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I'm, my own children go to these schools. I'm pretty confident when they have an officer there. Yeah. They don't have them at every school, which they did. Um, sure. I think that's one thing you need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. If you could have them at each school, nobody active shooter doesn't come in looking to get shot back at. No. Every time they get shot back at, they either they they kill themselves or they get killed by the cops. Right. They, it just doesn't work out for them. Yeah, that's what happened with the Virginia Tech shooter. That's why I'm with yeah. Columbine people. It's just yeah. It's like these people they're they're on a mission to kill. As soon as they know we're coming after them, they, it's not fun anymore. Yeah. Which they're a 
they're a special kind of people because I've, I've read like, you know, in all these cases of mass shootings in 80%, this is not 80% of these cases, somebody knew this yeah. person had this potential. They were told, they made threats, they said something, they wrote something, somebody heard it, somebody knew. People were like, oh, he's not serious or, oh, that was, that was 10 years ago. Never it's did like anything. that about most crimes. Is it? Because as soon as you hear somebody goes to jail and you're like, and everybody's like, oh, I'm so surprised. And there's always the people like, I'm not, man. He does this all the time. Or, you know, I've seen him doing that kind of stuff. All, you'll hear people say like, well, I do this about him. Or this seemed off. They just didn't say right. anything. I heard, I heard rumors together. about that, but I didn't yeah. believe it. Yeah. I mean, most most of the crimes, people have an idea. Oh, yeah. I mean, some somebody knows. Yeah. If in 80% of the cases, whether it's mass shootings or other crimes, 80%, 80% of people, at least one person. That's what it means. In 80% of those cases, at least one person knew, whether yeah. it's a spouse, a friend, coworker, somebody knew. I'm sure you've known somebody and you hear about them doing something and you're like, yeah, that didn't really surprise me. No, like, you know, I... Because <laughs> there's always those kind oh, of people. I, like, I, like I, I remember seeing people that got arrested and they were like, they're like, I can't believe you got arrested. I'm like, I can. Yeah, there's always people like that. It's like, why not? It's like, because it was obvious. <laughs> <laughs> this this person was they were bound to be a criminal they were born to be that way yeah. and that's uh that's that's an issue but uh you know when when you want to be if you're going to go and be the sheriff and I am uh, if you get elected you got you got a job cut out for you you've got a yes. jail you got to run you've got a count, you got a huge county to take care of you've got uh you got to deal with the community to build confidence back in the community especially after just these few incidents I listed in less than a year and I've got I've got some plans to deal with that. I mean, I can go over if you want. Or Yeah, what, what, well, what plans part, do you part of the, the jail is that the jail used to, when I when I got hired under Sheriff Hudson, the jail had detention officers, a lot of detention officers. How many? I, I don't know how many, but there was a lot of them. There's a lot more than there were deputies in the jail. So now what we've done, when Sheriff Warren came on, he got rid of all the detention officers. He made them either transition or they retired out or he, they just went away. Right. Um, detention officers are only trained to work the jail. Right. It's a two-week course, which they need a whole lot more in-house training, but it's mandated just to learn the very basics from the state to get your initial certification. Two weeks. It's kind of like learning to be a doctor or a nurse. You go to the school, but where do you learn the majority of what you do for a living? Yeah, doing the actual work. So it's two weeks from the state, this course you have to take, and then there's a training program. Mm. But what I'm getting at is a, a, a detention officer, you got to buy them a uniform, pepper spray, handcuffs. A deputy sheriff, we're looking at uniforms, guns, bullets, Batons, tasers, yep. cars, bulletproof vests, the whole nine Mag- yards. Magazines, everything. Boots. And their salary is generally 15, 20 grand higher than a detention officer. Mm. And you're hiring someone that knew flat out they're, they're being hired to work in the jail. The problem with the sheriff now is that a lot of people, and I've heard this from everyone, I was even fed this. When you get hired, hey man, you'll just work here for a little bit and then we'll move you out to the road, to the street. Doesn't happen. It happened for me, but for 99% of the people, it doesn't happen. Mm. And I will admit, I was lucky, aptitude. Sure. I did well at it, my job. But for most people, it doesn't happen. Right. I talked to a guy the other day. It's been there a decade. A decade. Keeps hearing, they're like, maybe next year we'll move you. Yeah. It's, it's, like, it's not going to happen. So they, they realize they're getting older, and I want to do some of this fun stuff, and I have all this you know training I can't use. They're going to go gonna somewhere go else. to another department. Yeah. And They'll vote with their feet. They're... They're going to departments that pay them less. Now, the retirement plan in Cobb County does need to be addressed. It's it's not good. I was under the old plan where it was a good, solid Took care pension of plan. Yeah, um, Always can be better, but I thought it was a good, solid plan. Yeah. This mess they're on now, it's, I, 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 don't, I don't like it. It doesn't make sense. Even if somebody's just a, a steward of their money like nobody's business, they're yeah. not going to be okay when they retire. Wow. They're going to have to find something they're else They're going to have do. to go and be those school officers probably. Yeah, well, most of them guys I met, they just like doing it. They're bored. <laughs> well, but some of them are probably going to have to do it out of necessity. That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. I mean, if uh, this new retirement, they absolutely will. Mm-hmm. You've got to be in it 15 years to get vested. 15 years. So if we hire, yeah, it was seven under my plan. Wow. So if we hire a uh, good officer from another department, and he's 40 or 50 years old, yeah. he brings in all this experience, like work detectives or whatever. My God, he's got to work there forever to even qualify for retirement. So it's crazy. But I think detention officers, you can put more of them on the street. You can put yeah. more of them in the jail. Right. Get the deputies back on the street where they need to be. Mm-hmm. The other day, there was, you won't believe this. I can just tell you this. They had. After everything I've heard, I'm like, I might. <laughs> okay. Oh, night shift for Cobb County has a population nearing um, 800,000. Yeah. It's huge. Three deputies on duty for the whole county. Three. 
That's one, two, three. Three people for 800,000 people. Are yep. you kidding me? So we don't serve warrants at night. They don't serve papers. They don't, serve papers. They don't have they don't the manpower. They can't do anything. And then <laughs> when I was getting near the end supervising, oh, my goodness. There was one Sunday where it was uh, the major, the lieutenant. I was a sergeant, another sergeant, and one deputy. Oh my God! I was like, "This is ridiculous." No, that, that, that's you know, like I. It's I, too I, top heavy. You, you hear the you hear that stuff. Like I, I grew up in I grew up in Towns County, Georgia, up in the yeah, up I in know the mountains. So, yeah. yeah, I grew up there, and we had a very small sheriff's department, but we had two police departments to back them up. Yeah. So you felt safe, and granted, there wasn't a lot of crime. And matter of fact, back in when Rudy Roach was sheriff, CNN called it the safest place in the entire United Good. States to live. Yeah. So I understand having a small town. Like a friend of mine grew up in Texas, and in the town he lived in, it was Cortez. Texas, I think, so not far from the Mexican border. And this was the uh, this was the department or the officers that were on duty. You had the sheriff, you had the chief deputy, you had one deputy, his partner, and you had the constable. And that was it. And it was a small town, probably probably less than ten thousand people. But it might have been okay for the population and crime rate. Yeah. But this isn't okay for Cobb. But no. no. It's because the sheriff also does all the mental health transports. They pick up all the shoplifters. They serve warrants, serve civil papers. So during the week when you've got 10 guys on duty, 10. 10 for 800,000. 10. They cannot keep up. There's a reason there's twenty to 30,000 unserved warrants sitting there at the sheriff's office. They can't serve them. There's not enough people. No. Because... They send two people to serve a warrant, but ideally serve a warrant, you need four. Mm. I need people in the back of the house. Otherwise, when you knock on the front of the door, Skippy goes out the back. Yeah. It's silly. I've seen it. I'm sure. <laughs> so you need, you need, and if you're going to go in the house to go get somebody out, you, you got to have more people. And then mental health, every, you have no idea how many of these we do a day in Cobb County. It's a service we, we're required to do by law that we do. So every time somebody feels suicidal or whatever, and they need to go to the hospital for treatment, mm-hmm. forcible treatment. Um, even if they agree to it, the doctor's like, you're in such a bad place, I'm signing an order. You're going. I, I don't think you. I, I don't think I need to send you home. Right. You're, it's just too much for you right now. Yeah. So they'll send an order, and they want them to go to Ridgeview or Peachford Hospital or even Kennesaw Wellstar for an evaluation by a psychiatrist on duty. Right. Somebody trained in that field, especially, you know, day, night, whatever, they'll send them. Yeah. And sometimes a probate judge will hear a hearing from a family and say, like, my loved one's a drug user, I'll call it. They will refuse to get help. They're dying. Right. And the judge will intervene and issue an order for us to go pick them up. Sure. And so there's five, six of them a shift that it takes two to four deputies to take just the mental health people to the hospitals, to the location. So if it's out of county they're supposed to take them to, then we have to drive out of county. And when somebody's mentally ill, indigent, without insurance, whatever, in Cobb, we have to take them to Rome. What? Yeah. You can't take them in, you can't take them in the county? No, they take them to Rome. Why? Because that's a whole other issue. State of Georgia has been closing down all the mental health treatment facilities. Yeah. That, as a society, a, we can pretend mentally ill people don't exist. They've always time, existed. They will continue time, to exist. Yeah, at a time when people don't think we have a mental health crisis in this country, yeah. like we just and no, with, we absolutely do. We have a huge mental health crisis in this country, and it needs to stop. It needs to be treated for what it is. It's an illness. You yeah. can help people, and you don't help people by shutting it down and throwing them in a jail cell. Yeah, they don't need a jail. That is the worst place they need to be. No. Because God forbid this last the not this last guy that died, but the guy before him, mm. he was arrested by an agency in Cobb as he was leaving the psych ward. What? Because he wasn't acting right. He was like walking out in traffic and doing all this stuff. Oh so, my God! As a peace officer, you have the ability. There's a form you fill out, just like the doctor. Yeah. There's a 2013. There's a 1013. You just flip it over and you fill out. As a peace officer, I can take him back there. Yeah. And be like, Hey, he's not acting right. I believe he's whatever. It's just like people for public drunk. I've had a person walking down the street drunk. Mm-hmm. Can I take him to jail? Is that really going to teach this alcoholic homeless person a lesson? No. No. Can I take him to the hospital, get him out of traffic, get I, him checked out? Sure. Because I've heard of officers doing that. Like there was a, there they was that, send him, he sobers up, they kick him back yeah, out. There was that famous case where there was that cop, you no know, guy was sitting underneath a car and it was raining. I don't remember where this was. Yeah. And uh, the cop, uh, and this guy was, about three times the size of this this mm-hmm. officer, and the guy all of a sudden he like he squats down and he comes up and he just screams and the deputy said it was like he was powering up yeah. and, and he starts walking towards the deputy like you're nothing come here I've had that. <laughs> and and the and the deputy you know sprays sprayed the guy yeah took, usually took, doesn't work on them yeah well it worked on this guy thankfully no, that's good <laughs> um, and but they they didn't take the guy to jail he took him to the hospital yeah he said and he said that guy didn't need jail. That guy needed No, because you treatment. take somebody out of jail, and now he's charged with a crime. He has no lawyer. He can't communicate. He might be in jail six or seven months on something where the fine's $100, and it costs us $75 a day to keep him. 
Good Lord. Well, and he won't be treated. It's ridiculous. Yeah, it's a, that's a, and that's a huge drain on resources. It's a drain on family. It's a, it's it's yeah. creating more problems than it needs to be. But uh, but Jimmy, unfortunately, our hour has run out. I have uh, enjoyed this immensely. Uh, good luck in your campaign. Thank you. I'm going to keep in touch. I hope you'll come back again. We'll yes, talk sir. some more about this. So everyone, my guest has been James Herndon. He's running for sheriff of Cobb County. You can uh, find him at Herndon for Sheriff on Instagram. You can also find him on uh, Herndon for Sheriff on Facebook. Uh, your campaign uh, is going to have a um, uh, launch party uh, when at the end of this week. Friday night. Um, 7 to 11 at La Catrina Mexican Bar and Grill on South Cobb Drive. Nice. So if you're in the area, you want to talk to James, you want to give him some ideas, you want to see some change in this county, if anything you hear today doesn't make you think we've got problems in this county and we need a new lawman to step in and take over, well, then I don't know what to tell you, okay? But James, good luck. Thanks for being here, man. Right. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. And uh, everybody, I'm Eric Barnard. This has been the Free Speech Zone. I'll see you next time.